Well, good evening, folks. It's uh, right at seven on the dot, and um, what I want to do tonight is um, we've covered Galatians. We're making our transition, but we didn't get to answer the questions, so in all fairness to our Galatians study, we need to um, finish our, our Galatians 6 questions, and um, then I, I've got a lot that I want to hand out as well as cover tonight in our, um, as we transition into 1 Corinthians. Now, in the order in our New Testaments, you don't go from Galatians to 1 Corinthians. But what we're seeking to do is to follow the order in which they were written, the chronological order. So that's where we're coming from, having covered 1 and 2 Thessalonians and then Galatians. Now Galatians, we move next to 1 Corinthians. So let's begin our study with a word of prayer. Let's bow together at this time. Dear Father in heaven, we do thank you for every blessing of the day. And what a joy it is to meet together tonight to study your word with those of like precious faith. We're thankful for each one here, and we're thankful for your word, and we pray that we'll be filled with the knowledge of your will, that we'll have a, a spirit of wisdom and understanding, and that we'll bear fruit in every good work that will be pleasing in your sight. Bless us, we pray. Bless those that have special needs this evening. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now the um, questions on chapter 5, I understand that uh, Celeste had the last question last time in chapter 5. Is that correct? Keith, is that correct in Galatians? Okay. So, Zach, are you, are you prepared to start number 1, please? Number two, please. Okay. We are projecting the questions, not for you to get the questions off the screen, although that might be handy if you don't have your questions. But we're doing this so that those that are streaming can see the question as we're as we're covering those. Even if they cannot hear your comment, they will see the question and keep up with where we're at. So that's kind of, I asked the guys back there if they could do that tonight, and they've been gracious to help me with that. Number three is next, please. Okay, good. And number four is next. So that, uh, that balances out, doesn't it? We bear one another's burdens, but each one must carry his own load, his own cargo, as, as another uh, translation might put it. Number five is next. Verse number six there, isn't it, uh, Shirley? Okay, good. Number six is next there. And number, that was number six. Number seven is next. By the way, have you all noticed that uh, Joe has two grandsons with him that he's keeping up with for 10 days? So take a good look at him while he still has his sanity. 
Just kidding. Uh, Connor and Logan, the two boys. I'm sure they're fine boys. And Joe is brave. Number eight is next. Good, good. Y'all are doing good on these. Number nine is next there. Yeah, and what was the other thing that is noteworthy there? Large letters. No, notice that. Number 10 is next. And also, notice also that they would avoid persecution. That's in verse 12. That's important to see that, that they're, they're trying to get out of uh, being persecuted by uh, the, the teaching that uh, would not be offensive to the, the Jewish community in, in, that, in that instance. What it did, of course, was to pervert the gospel and take away from the efficacy of Jesus' death on the cross. In other words, if, if his blood is incomplete, then um, as the Apostle Paul said, uh, Christ is a minister of sin, Galatians 2 verse 17. So this was an effort to, uh, to glory in their flesh and to avoid persecution. Number 11 is next. Okay, good. Fun to work. That brings us up to this section, number 12. Okay. 13 is next. That's the one thing that matters. Number 14 is next. And that leads us to number 15. Who are the Israel of God? We are. Okay, those who are Christians. Number 16 is next. Wayman, are we passing to you? Does anybody have another translation besides Mark's? What, what does that mean? Scars, uh, the idea is that of brand, and literally, of course, it's talking about the scars that really were no doubt all over his body for, from the many beatings and the stoning and all the, the, uh, that he had been through. New American Standard is brand marks. Brand marks. Mm -hmm. Number 17 is next. Now, what I need, and let me tell you what I need. I need four guys that are real fast. I'm not going to give out everything. I've got three handouts, but I do want you to have this. And if y'all can divvy this up, and everybody needs one. No need for conversation or to see if you have this. It's just now printed up, so just, just take one, please, and div divvy it up, and uh, that will really help me a lot. One reason I'm passing this out to you is because I'm, as I introduced the book, um, instead of you trying to write all this down, you can make notations on your, on your sheet, but this, this front and back is going to be the introduction. I'm not going to just read it to you, but some of the points that I will make will, can be found right here. Appreciate you, brethren, helping me. In addition to what they're passing you out now, I also have a map because I knew with the map I'm going to show tonight that Daryl would say, can you make us a copy? So I've already made everyone a copy. 
Keith has punched all these. He and Mark did that to help me out before service has started. So I've got a, a map that will help us that goes back to when Paul preached at Corinth in the second journey. And it's really a good map. It's, the, it's from the Satellite Bible Map Atlas. It's really good. Everybody just, yeah, whatever's left over, give it to Cheryl. Thank you. Thank you, guys. So, in addition to the map, you'll also have uh, another sheet front and back that has questions on Chapter 1 and Chapter 2. So, we'll be kind of uh, caught up with that. So, as, as I make a notation here in, in the introductory sheet, both 1st and 2nd Corinthians were written during Paul's third missionary journey. Paul makes reference both, uh, I mean, you just have the book of Acts, and you look at the letters themselves, and he makes reference in the letters to where he was, and you can fit that in in his journeys in Acts, so it's easily done. So he makes reference, we, we know that he spent most of his time on the third journey in Ephesus, three years. And he makes reference in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 to his remaining in Ephesus till winter. So that, that clearly puts him in the third journey because second journey, remember the Spirit of the Lord did not suffer Paul to preach in Asia, and Ephesus was the most important city of Asia. Ephesus was the fourth largest city in the world. But uh, anyway, this the third journey, that, that's when he was there. So he, he's there in, the, in this first letter. Then he's making his way to Corinth for a revisit and when he meets Titus at Macedonia, which today is northern Greece, but then was a separate province, but from Macedonia, again, he makes reference to that in the letter, he writes 2 Corinthians in advance of his arrival at Corinth on that third journey. And on that third journey, he's going to winter at Corinth. He'll stay three months, and that's where he'll write the letter of Romans, you see. And he makes reference to being there uh, uh, again, all that fits in. So, we're talking tonight, though, about Corinth. So, Paul preaches there. Here's the thing to remember about Corinth. Ephesus, Paul stayed there for three years, longest stay of any place uh, when he was able to come and go as he wished. On this second journey, though, that Ephesus is number three. Number two, uh, at Corinth, that's the second longest stay because that's where he stays 18 months and then after that it says he tarried many days. So it, he stayed a year and a half plus a little bit longer than that. So it was, it was during that stay that he wrote two of the letters we've already covered, 1 Thessalonians and um, 2 Thessalonians were written from Corinth on Paul's second journey. The city of Corinth was known for idolatry. It was known for immorality. It had two ports. Besides the fact that it was that, that it was um, the site itself had a lot of idolatry with the local residents and plenty of sin to go around that way, the fact that there was so much travel there. I say it had two ports. That's really unusual from, from the standpoint of one to the south, one to the north. But the isthmus of Corinth is, I think, less than four miles across. And that tiny stretch of land separates the Aegean from the Adriatic Sea. And so, so there are a lot, there's a lot of commerce there, a lot of coming and going, and a lot of, of immorality. You, you know that places like that where ships dock and, and there's commerce, that sort of thing, that, that there's going to be ordinarily a lot of drunkenness, a lot of fornication, those kind of things that, that go hand in hand with it. Not saying everybody did that, but it's still, it was so prevalent at Corinth that the word Corinth, which is the, the name of the place, was used um, in a verbal form to Corinthianize meant to commit fornication. Or if you wanted to say that a woman was a loose woman, that her, she did not have strict morals, you would refer to her as a Corinthian girl. So they, they had a name in, in, a city, in a setting in the first century where there's a lot of immorality, a lot of idolatry. 
Corinth kind of stood above us where that's even more prevalent there. And so as I say in my notes, of course it wouldn't do any good to preach the gospel there, right? And the Lord appeared to Paul and he said, I want you to stay here for I have much people in this city. You see, God knows the hearts of all. And he knew that there were people that would turn from sin and see the emptiness of it and would be attracted to the gospel. And so we're going to read in Acts 18 and verse 8, many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. And after Paul mentions some of the sins we've mentioned and more in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9, he will go on to 9 and 10, he'll go on to say in verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 6, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and in the Spirit of our God. God's grace is greater than our sin. And uh, those who were willing to turn from sin and comply with God's law of pardon were saved by the blood of Christ. And so uh, we, we see the power of the gospel, and again, that the Lord personally, it's not like He always appeared to Paul and said how long he was to stay and that sort of thing, but as, as far as the record goes. But here we have a record where the Lord appeared to him and said, I want you to stay. I have much people in this city. They weren't his yet, but they were going to be. You know what I want the Lord to look down upon us and say? I want him to say, I've got some people at Hansville. Those are my people. Now that's what he's saying about Corinth. I've got, I've got you know, I'm, I, I'm, uh, I've got my mark at 1 Corinthians, but really I'm, I'm kind of summarizing a whole lot of information that's found in the um, 18th chapter of, of the book of Acts. And um, yeah, it's verse 10 that I'm thinking of where Jesus appeared to him and said, I'm with you, no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. And there, there are two things that, are good, that, that can constitute good news in that passage. One is the fact that the Lord has much people in this city, but also I'm sure that was refreshing to Paul after all he had been through to hear that part that uh, no one will hurt you. So the persecution that's, that's been in, in other places, I mean, just as you look at the previous chapter, uh, he's just having, having to go from place to place because of of, uh, of persecution, but here the Lord says, no one will attack you to hurt you. So that's a little different too in Acts 18 and verse 8. So um, what we're going to see, there's an occasion for writing all the letters, of course, and Paul hears that there's division at Corinth. And uh, so the first thing he does is to write this letter to address that. It's an inspired letter, but it's occasioned by local circumstances. And so what you'll see in the first six chapters, I'll tell you what, if you will, just kind of um, turn over to page two for, for our points right now. What, what you'll see in the, in the first six chapters, Paul will say, it's commonly reported. I hear that there are divisions among you. Now that's the first four chapters. You get to chapter 5, what does he say? There's, uh, he, he's been told that there's fornication, such as is not among the Gentiles. And then in chapter 6, he's, he's hearing that there are lawsuits. In other words, these are problems reported. He's responding to what he has heard by reliable witnesses in chapters 1 through 6. So you see, you, you see again, the, we've given an assignment to each individual chapter. But then, there's a difference. There's a shift when you get to chapter 7 in 1 Corinthians where Paul says, now concerning the things whereof you wrote. So first, he's responding to what's been reported to him. Secondly, he's responding to questions that, that folks from there have written him. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote. And so he'll be dealing with marriage questions. He'll be dealing with, really, 8, 9, and 10 are dealing with idolatry. But in the mix of that, uh, sensitivity to the brother's conscience. Here, here's something that's not has no connection to idolatry anymore, but in his mind he's associating eating of meat with idolatry. You've got to care about his conscience and not act in such a way as to cause him to sin. And you say, well, that's my right. But in chapter 9, Paul says, let me tell you about my rights that I have been willing to forego for the sake of the gospel. 
And then in chapter 10 he continues with that. And the point is uh, to flee idolatry. Chapter 11 deals with headship and the Lord's Supper. Chapter 12 verse 1 begins by saying now concerning spiritual gifts. And really 12, 13, and 14 are about spiritual gifts. Chapter 13, which is that great chapter on love, is about spiritual gifts. Because what Paul is saying is, if I speak with the tongue of men and angels and have not love, if I no, no prophecies, if I ha- have the miraculous ability to, to cast, a, be, cast a mountain into the sea and have not love. So in all of this, prophecies will fail. Doesn't mean they won't come to pass it, but the gift of prophecy would fail. Tongues will cease. Knowledge will pass away. But he talks about the quality of love that will continue and will abide forever. Chapter 14 continues with that thought and shows how that uh, in services that everything is to be done decently and in order. And so he gives regulations for the use of spiritual gifts in chapter 14. Chapter 15 is the great resurrection chapter, longest chapter, 58 verses. Then chapter 16, in conclusion, of course, we'll deal with, everybody knows what that deals with. It, it's, it's dealing with a matter of the contribution for the needy saints at Jerusalem. And then some personal closing remarks and, and salutations, of course, the greetings. So um, that's a survey of, of, of the letter as far as uh, where it is written, why it's written, what it's about, things like that. Uh, going back to page one, I've, I've just, you know, you can always draw lessons from, from the book. Um, one great lesson we'll see in the first chapter is Christians are followers of Christ, not of the preacher. And, and Paul was not trying to get people to follow him. Peter wasn't. Apollos wasn't. But some were dividing among themselves in that regard. And so uh, Paul deals with that. And and the point that he's making is they had heard the word of the Lord. They had believed on the Lord. They had turned to the Lord. They had obeyed the Lord. They were baptized into Christ. Paul was the messenger through whom they learned the truth. And then I guess I've touched on my second lesson already. But when you think in terms of departure from God's standard on every hand in, in our society today, What's happening is our society today is becoming more like the world of the first century. It's becoming more like the world that the gospel entered into and turned that world upside down. And so if if people are as bad as the Corinthians, as wicked as the Corinthians, the point of it is we have the same gospel. And so we we need to take courage instead of saying, well, you know, it's just so bad nobody uh, cares about the truth. Uh, we, the, the gospel has not lost its power. So we, uh, we learn that from this book. So anyway, you've got that, um, and that's uh, something to refer to as an introduction. I think it's important to know the setting of a book, to know what it's about, and uh, again, we've looked at the individual chapters there as well. Got a lot I want to share with you tonight, but let me pause and ask, does anyone have a question on anything pertaining to what we've said thus far? Anybody? Well, it's not all that many. Let me see. I've just got 30 slides. Not all that many. I don't know what I was panicking about. And that's one of them already, see? Okay, so you're going to get this as your map. I've already got it run off. It's punched. It's ready for you. But again, on, the, on that second journey, um, Paul's going to go over land, pass through the Sicilian gates, revisit the churches of Galatia. The Spirit of the Lord would not suffer him to preach through Asia, Mysia, or Bithynia. I'm sorry, pointing wrong. Bithynia is up here, Bithynia. So he passed through to Troas, crossed the Aegean Sea, Macedonia, coming on down, leaving Berea, sailing to the port of Athens. Preached at Athens, but then he goes to Corinth, and that's where he stayed over 1.5 years right there. Would you like to see a little bit of a close-up of that where you don't have to strain? 
your eyes. So there you have it. So here's where we're going to be in our, in our study as far as the, as the geography is concerned. Again, the Aegean Sea, the Adriatic Sea, the narrow isthmus right here, and there's a port, uh, Sincrea right here was a port city, also a congregation there, and uh, then there's a port on the north side of the city there as well. This, by the way, is a photograph. Everything else I'm showing you tonight are photographs I've taken. I've been to Corinth uh, on three different times and scheduled to go again this spring. But this is, this is a photograph that I'm crediting here to Todd Bolin of BiblePlaces.com. And where it's taken from is the Acro Corinth. And I'm going to show you that from down below. But from above, you can look down. And again, you can see this, uh, this very narrow isthmus. And again, the, uh, the, uh, well, I'm going to show you this area right here that connects the two. Got some shots of that. But again, connecting the Aegean and the Adriatic Sea, as you, as you see there. Now, uh, what, what happens is that sailors, could I go back? Do I need to go back? Yeah. If, if for example, you're going to Rome, and you could, you, from Ephesus, and you could sail pretty well straight across like so, and, um, and go f across this isthmus, and then continue sailing through, and make your way on around to, to Rome, that's so much better than navigating through all these small islands, and it, it's just really dangerous here to go to the south of the Peloponnese, and so that was desirable. And so what they did, they, this really goes back to the time of Nero in its uh, conception, Nero used uh, slave labor, including some Jews, by the way, to, he was going to dig through the dirt to dig through and connect the two seas. The problem is um, it's solid rock after you go down just a little bit. So he started it, but he couldn't do it. So here's what, here's what was done. In fact, it's only in fairly recent times that they've made the connection with, you know, with the invention of dynamite and blasting. And, you know, dynamite can do a lot of good, Brady. You know what I mean? And so good old dynamite, someone that's a blaster like Brady, you know, he, he'd know how to handle this. So anyway, the, um, the Okos was the pavement that connected the two seas so that ships if they were small enough, would be put on sleds and then pull across by mule power to the other side and then see the, the, the pavement just went right on down into the water, you know, kind of like launching a boat. I mean, at, at a boat launch, you know, we, we do trailer and everything. If it were too big to do that, if the ship could not be pulled, they would unload their cargo, transport the cargo again, wagons and mules, and then secure another ship at the port on the other side and then sail. That's how they would do it. So we can actually see some of the, some of the uh, pavement there. It's kind of grown up, but these paving stones and coming right on down, can you see, let me show you, you have to have trained eyes, but that is the sea right there. And um, this is a quotation from the Biblical Archaeology Society that summarizes what I just said, that the stone paved sledway, the, the Ocos, was used to haul ships and their cargoes across the isthmus. At both ends of the road, the pavement continued down beneath the water line, allowing the shallow draft ships to be floated onto and off of the sleds. The sleds were then pulled out of the water and across the isthmus by mule power. So i uh, been able to, to be there and, and take a couple of shots of that. But this is, this is why people could not dig through. You see what I'm talking about? And, and so uh, now you can, uh, you, you can, I've, I've seen, in fact, there's a, there's a ship in the distance right there that's about to be pulled through. That's why it's up right, right over there. You're seeing the, the sea on that side. If we turn around, we see the sea on the other side. So this is, this is how narrow that strip of land is, the Isthmus of Corinth. And as I say, now the canal goes through. Ships that go through here are pulled by tugboats. I've, I've seen them go through that way. Okay, so that's, that's important to know that about ancient Corinth. We're just kind of entering into the biblical world there. But here we are. Here we are looking next. I was telling you before, I, I said that this photograph by Todd Boland was taken from the Acro Corinth. You remember that? Um, and 
See, every city has its Acropolis. It's not just Athens. Athens happens to be the most famous Acropolis. But Acropolis just means high city. That's all that means. And that's where people could go if they were threatened in times you know, where defense was needed. But anyway, up here, at the top of this, this is the Acrocorinth, and that's where we were in that photo a while ago. But there used to be a temple to the goddess Aphrodite that was there, and it is said that it housed a thousand sacred prostitutes that in the name of their religion committed fornication, lewd acts. And so the, actually the temple was gone by Paul's day, but the influence was very much still there. A lot of excavation has been done at Corinth. And uh, you know what? Just for the next few photos, I think that I can enhance what you're seeing here just a little bit by doing that. Is that better? Mark, is that better? Okay. Uh, some remaining columns here. Of course, those with trained eyes know that these are Corinthian columns, right? That's right. And uh, presence of Jews. You know, there, we, we read about the Jews in the synagogue there at Corinth, and one of the, one of the artifacts that has been found by archaeologists is a, a synagogue inscription there at Corinth. And uh, along, as, as you look at what has been excavated, it's, it's kind of like a, a square. There were various buildings in the middle, but along the, the, the uh, perimeters, there were these shops that, that you can see. And so uh, various, in, in the first century, various stores would have been set up, shops would have been set up uh, where, for example, Aquila and Priscilla were there making tents in Acts 18. They likely would have had a shop somewhere right along in here. Leather goods people had shops. Uh, meat markets had shops and, and so forth. And in fact, uh, uh, again, a sign placed there by the archaeologist making reference to this being a, uh, the West shops. And there is a little museum. I'm going to show you some things. These are, uh, I'm going to share some things that were found right there on the site by the excavators. And one of the things that I thought was just fascinating was this sign right here that was pointing to the meat market, or the sign at the meat market, really, because this was exactly what Paul was talking about when he said that you can eat what is sold in the meat market without that violating your conscience as far as that being right to do. In other words, however, if, if, if initially it had been sacrificed to an idol, but the point is it's been processed, here it is, and it's now for sale as meat, you're not worshiping the idol, you're just buying meat at the meat market. And so he, he's saying that that is not violating any scripture. But then he talks about other things to keep in mind. But at any rate, this is, this is the sign for a meat market there in, um, in Corinth. And again, you can just uh, kind of get a feel for the city as you, as you walk about there. I've been here a, a couple of times when it was bright, nice sunshine. Doesn't always have nice sunshine, by the way. Um, here's something else that's mentioned specifically in Acts chapter 18, and that is the Bema, B-E-M-A. Word Bema has to do with, it, really the, the meaning literally is uh, something high. Bama is high. Bema. But in, in this sense, it's you know how words lend themselves to, so, so it's a high place, a high seat. The idea is it's a judgment seat. For example, this is used in 2 Corinthians 5 when Paul says in verse 10 that we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Bema, same word is used. So in Acts chapter 18, it talks about Paul being brought before the judgment seat of the proconsul whose name was Gallio. And we know when he when he was proconsul from 51 to 53, that's how we know exactly that Paul was there at that time. But anyway, it says that Paul was brought to the high place. And Gallio said, listen, the, this, these charges are ridiculous. They have no place in my court. And he threw it out, threw, threw the case out. And so Paul was not harmed. And Sosthenes, the ruler, the ruler of the synagogue, they turned on him. But the the judgment seat is right here. That, uh, that sign right there, by the way, has the word in Greek and in English, bema. And so you can, you can actually see the foundational part and the area where Paul would have been 
I think that's just amazing that, you know, that that remains, where Paul would have been brought on charges there at the, at the judgment seat. Again, Acts 18 and verse 12 mentions that. So the judgment seat, the Bema, is exactly right there. But as I was saying, sometimes it rains. And so when I'm taking people to Bible lands and it rains, I'll say, you know, this is what it looked like when Paul was here when it rained. So, I mean, you want to have a feel of it. Do you think it was all sunshine when Paul was there? So that keeps people from whining, you know, to make points like that. So this day, I mean, it was raining, it was wet, but you can see there is the Bema right there behind those two people, those two unidentified people. But just kind of walking around a little bit further, there's some more shops, Northwest shops here. And uh, as I'm looking at things like that, I'm thinking of Priscilla and Aquila. It's going to mention specifically in Acts 18 that they uh, were, were tent makers. And uh, Paul was a tent maker by trade, and so he stayed with them for a while. And, uh, you know, it doesn't say they had a shop at this place, but very likely they would have had a shop to sell their goods. Warning you, we're not going to do this every time, but um, I've just got so much I wanted to share with you in terms of this place. Oh, by the way, uh, I added on that little arrow there. That sign is right there, that I'm doing a sidebar of it right there. Um, another historical reference that's made in the book of Acts, chapter 18, it says, Paul found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And so the passage continues. But the reason Priscilla and Aquila are there is they, they've been kicked out of Rome. All the Jews had to leave Rome here, and it was the emperor Claudius that did that. So we know his reign, and again, it fits in with this time we're talking about. But this is a photograph I took of the bust of, uh, of Claudius there. So as we, as we look around, we've left the shops there, and as, as we look around a little bit, we can, we can see some other things that are of interest. Here's the Temple of Apollo. Doric columns there, Bill, if you have trained eyes on that one too. Uh, the Temple of Apollo, and sometimes you might say, well, was that there in the days of Paul? This was there 700 years before Paul. And when Paul was here, it was already in ruins. But again, the influence is what was, was there. So, um, again, the Temple of Apollo, quite prominent. And, and here's a shot that I took where you're, you're seeing two important sites. You're seeing the Temple of Apollo in the foreground. And again, in the background, you're seeing the Acrocorinth where the Temple of Aphrodite was there. Speaking of Aphrodite, again, in the museum, what they have in this small museum are artifacts that were found right there at Corinth. And so this, this is a bust of Aphrodite that was discovered there, the, one of the goddesses that was worshipped. Also, Zeus was worshipped. This bust was excavated there. And also you have an image of Asclepios, the god of healing, and uh, a number of body parts that were left as votive offerings there at Corinth by people that had come to the temple of Asclepius. Well, there's one other thing that I wanted to mention to you. And that is, it's a, it goes back to Romans chapter 16, and that is the Erastus inscri inscription. Now let me, let me kind of give you a feel for where you are. You see the Acro Corinth. Did I do what? A, there we go. You see the acro Corinth up here. Where these people are standing, and kind of back over here, that's where the town of Corinth is. Where we are here is the theater. It's in pretty bad shape, but, but if, if you'll, you, know, you can kind of get a feel of how it's rounded and go, you know, circular, goes around like so. But right here in the foreground is what is called the Erastus inscription. And what you want to do is relate this. Again, Paul was at Corinth when he wrote, wrote Romans in the third journey. And in Acts chapter 16, he writes in verse 23 in the closing of the book, he says, Gaius, my host, and the host of the whole church greets you. Then he says this, Erastus, the treasurer of the city, greets you 
and Cortus, a brother. Now, what you have is the name of an, an official, Erastus, the treasurer of the city. He's the treasurer of the city of Corinth. What you have here at Corinth is the same name, the same, exactly the same title that Paul uses in the text right here. Same name, same title. What the inscription says is that he paid for this part of the pavement out of his own funds. That's just like today if somebody might uh, build a building, for example, or, or furnish a building out of his own funding, there might be a plaque that's put up there that, that this was donated by so-and-so. And so this was quite common in, in biblical times as well. Here someone pays for the street, not out of uh, public funds or tax funds, but out of his own pocket, his own resources. So the Erastus inscription was there. I know it would be possible for somebody else to have the same name and the same title at the same time. It would be possible. But... I'm among those that believe that this is, this is the name, that this is a person, this is the very same one. It fits perfectly that, that Paul is, is uh, speaking of. And so the Erastus inscription is quite well known. And many scholars, many archaeologists believe that there's, that there's no reason to doubt that this is the same one that Paul is referring to. Same name, same title, same place. The, the time fits. This is Roman, first century. So I, that, that's important. I'm amazed that it is still there because usually something of value like this will be moved to a museum for its own protection. But uh, it, it's far enough away and, and it, you know, it's okay the last time I was there. And uh, so there you have it. it it's, a, it's a pretty big sign just to kind of give you a, a feel for that. And uh, this photo was taken in 2006. Have I changed any since then? Just a little? Okay. Just a little. Okay. Appreciate that. Kindness. Uh, Farrell Jenkins took that photo. Yes, I mean, uh, it is, it is, Erastus is, is taking up a whole lot of it, his name. And the Greek term is uh, Edelphile or something like that. And, and again, it's saying he paid for the pavement out of his funds. That's what the inscription says. It's just honoring him as the, as the donor of the funds. But yeah, it, it's just his name, his title, and, and what he did here. So it looks like I've got two more minutes, and boy, is this going to work out good. Because that was my last photo. And so here again, uh, what we're having as we look at the book, are the problems reported to Paul? And then his reply to questions that continues all the way through chapter 15. And then you've got the instruction and conclusion in chapter 16. Now, what I want to do with the, what do I have, a minute and a half left? This says 7.43. Uh, James, can you turn the light back on for me? What I'd like to do with this last minute or so is to uh, go ahead and what I need now, I need eight guys, four and four, to pass the, these out, please. So you're in charge of that stack. Get four people that look like they know what they're doing. And Brady, you're in charge over here. He's the dynamite guy.
If you're following along in your songbook tonight, go ahead and be turning to number 263. 263, that'll be the song of invitation. Brother Thomas Poe will be leading us in that in just a little while. It's good to see each one tonight. Glad you could be here. I've had the opportunity recently uh, to talk to several Christian friends, especially concerning the invitation about what, and I do this a lot, especially when I'm preaching or even giving an invitation, what is something that I can say, what is something I can do that would make a difference in somebody's life? What is something I could say is the old adage, what is something that I could throw out there that's going to prick the heart, to make somebody see the error of their way, to make them see that they need to be baptized, that they need to be saved, that they need to repent of their sins? What is something I can do? And honestly, I haven't come up with a good response yet. But the only thing I know to do is kind of like Josh has talked about in a couple of his invitations is, is tell you what the Bible says. This is not what Mark Davis says. This is what God's informed us. And I hope the examples I provide tonight uh, will be beneficial in that and there's something we can take from it. And if you haven't yet obeyed the gospel of Christ, it is something that, uh, that you'll take to heart. Turn with me to Luke chapter 12. Luke 12, beginning in verse 16. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then, those, then whose will those things you have be provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Here we've got an example of Jesus speaking of a young man. He just produced an amazing crop. Uh, he had a wonderful harvest and currently had an enormous wealth. And is there anything with wrong with having these things? No. But when that becomes our main focus, that's where the problem occurs, when we make no preparation for our own soul. When our time is consumed more with making money, working ourselves to death to make more money, never being satisfied, keeping our nose stuck in things that we don't need to be, participating in self-consuming activities, when we neglect our opportunities for thanksgiving, for chances to worship, that's where we fall short. And that's when the end result is when we fail to give glory to God for what he has done for us. This type of thinking is foolish because you've wasted your time and you've not taken into account what is going on when death occurs. When we choose to not put God first, when we choose to build up riches here instead of heaven, when we do not glorify God for all he has done for us, we are a fool and we will spend all of eternity in hell regretting it. Continuing in Luke 12, verse 34, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. These are some strong words. These are some harsh words. And I don't think my goal is when I stand up here is to scare you into doing the right thing, but I think my goal, one of my obligations is to make the urgency aware that there is an urgent need because we don't know the time. We don't know when our soul will be required and are we prepared. So where is your heart currently? Because your heart is following your focus. And where is your focus at? Is your heart right with God? If your soul was required of you tonight, would you go to heaven? Have you made the good confession? Have you been baptized for the remission of sins? And are you living faithfully? If you've answered no to any of these, why? Why have you answered no? 
Have you truly faced the reality that we will die one day? It's going to happen. And this is not just for the old people. Go out to a graveyard sometime. There's as many young graves as there are old ones. And they're everywhere. This applies to everyone. What have we been doing to be prepared and start building up our treasures in heaven? Where is our treasure at? Where is your heart at? I hope you think on these things tonight uh, because these are serious matters. These are things we all need to take into account. If you haven't started being rich toward God and laying up those treasures in heaven, today is the time. Don't be rich in this world because it won't amount to anything. If there's anything we can do tonight to help you in any way, won't you please come as we stand and we sing.